But more than that, we are a community of educators passionate about coming together to talk about what's going on in our classrooms, in our schools. Um, education happens inside a room, but it also happens in our lives, in our parenting. So this is a space to come together and talk about issues. And of course, our own professional and personal development. The book that we've been reading this month is Teaching When the World is on Fire. Whether you read this book or not, tonight is a town hall, which means come one, come all. We have some amazing contributors who've been joining us via the live chat every week in YouTube. But this week, if you just want to jump in here with us, look at, check out the link below, which is tinyurl.com backslash 99pages edu. Then you have a chance to just jump into this broadcast. If you want to join us on video, come in, come in, come in. Um, and we'd love we'd love to see you. Uh, as always, feel free to post questions um, live or in the live chat, and we're happy to address it. A plug, as always, is that next week we start our next book, which is Onward by Elena Aguilar. It's about coaching. And because it's about coaching, it's about many things. It's about self-awareness. It's about approaching the stresses in our life with curiosity. It's about growth mindset. It's about emotional agility. Uh, so whether you're in education or not, if coaching, whether it's coaching others or self-coaching is something that you're interested in, if you're interested in how to help people achieve their personal and professional potential, I think this could be a book club that you'd be very interested. Again, we are every Wednesday night, this time, 5.30 Pacific, 8.30 PM Eastern. Smash that subscribe button, as Dan Kelly says, at the 99 pages so that you can um, keep track. So enough of me. I'm going to stop this highlighting. Boom. So we can see who has joined us. Now, these are our four brave, amazing participants, panelists tonight. But it is a town hall. So if you want to get in this, I want you on the air. So again, join that town hall link. But let's just go ahead and in case someone's a first timer, let's meet each other. So I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight Miss Laurel Staub. Tell us, who are you? Where are you coming from? Why did you join this tonight? Um, thank you, Jackie. Exciting to be here for the fourth night in our town hall, which is a lot more improvised. Um, so it's very exciting to be here. I am an educator. Uh, I've worked across pretty much all age groups from early childhood ed through adult learners. Um, and I currently work out of a university in Rwanda called um, African Leadership University. So I get to do a lot of learning experience design and, and work as a member of the faculty there. Um, but I'm working from New York uh, this term because it's all online. That's a little bit about me, but yeah. Um, and I'm really excited to be here tonight uh, to have this more interactive format and um, have it be a little bit more improvised and just speaking off the cuff. We'll see how it goes. Like a real book club. I love it. Like that is what this is trying to be. Tonight, I am not a moderator. I want everybody to just be able to jump in, but it is helpful to meet everyone. So next I'm going to go to Mr. Zachariah Sherbini as I, of course, take off Laurel's name and find Zach's name. There he is. Zachariah, who are you? Where are you coming from? Why did you join us tonight? Hi, so I'm coming to you from Baltimore, Maryland. I am uh, an early childhood educator, uh, an elementary school leader, taking the year off to pursue a variety of, um, of interests and passions, this being one of them. Uh, and I'm here tonight because I cannot say no to you, Jackie. <laughs> 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 uh, I love that answer. And I want everyone joining tonight to be able to not say no. And let me put up that link again, which is you can say yes and get on the broadcast <laughs> with us by joining this tiny URL. Um, awesome. Next up, we got to meet the one and only my friend and inspiration. Uh, the world needs more Dan Kelly's. Woo! Mm -hmm. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, sure. So uh, I am based out of New Rochelle, New York. I'm a teacher in a public middle school. Uh, super excited to be here tonight. I was just thinking as Laurel was talking there about um, just how we're improvising a little bit more tonight. Really hoping, I'm, I'm super excited to see who's going to be the first person to transcend the chat and just come right in and join us. Um, because I think that's a cool, cool opportunity. I know it takes a little courage to do that and, and that's great, but I also want to emphasize what Jackie just said. It's a book club. We're talking about a book, but even if you didn't read the book, that's okay because we're talking about ideas, you know, and, and that's what brings us all here together. Um, I saw, I sort of also made that comparison. Even 17 years into teaching, I still feel like I get a thrill 
every single time I walk into a classroom being like, all right, like I'm on, like, this is, this is me right now. Uh, trying to show the leadership and trying to cultivate like leadership within the kids. I also feel like it's one of the best things in the world as a development tool to t- take just one period or one day every once in a while and show up without a plan. Be like, today's going to be a day where I walk in and I'm just going to, we're going to go from the seat of my pants. And we're going to figure something out together because that is, that's honestly it's like, uh, what do they say? Uh, mother uh, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Like the idea of you jump in and especially once you've cultivated a good relationship with the students, you're like, let's let's talk about something. Let's have a conversation. Let's go from there. Of course, should we all have lessons planned all the time? Yes. But every once in a while, is it good to rebuild from scratch? Yes, indeed it is. So Jackie, thank you. I'm super excited to see what happens tonight. Yes, perfect. Tonight, there is no lesson plan. It is a live in the moment. Um, find the teachable moments wherever they come. I see some awesome people that I'm peer pressuring in the live chat. If you want to join live on video, we'd love to have you. Of course, if you prefer to be off video, you are a valuable participant in the live chat as well. Um, But speaking of courage and the first person to join from the 99 Pages larger community, I want to introduce my friend, Cynthia Abbott. Woo! So Cynthia... Go ahead and, um, of course, at some point, you know, find your little tag here. But tell us, you, um, um, this is the first time we've met you. Who are you? Why did you join us tonight? Yeah, so I'm Cynthia Abbott, um, and I am a leader in the people operation and HR space. And I think there's just so much cross collaboration and importance because right now a lot of individuals on my teams you know they have kids maybe they're at home they're distance learning they're doing hybrid and it's a shared stress right between parent and child as far as what we're all going through and i just i think there's a lot that i can learn and that we can share with one another and and support each other in this space so thank you so much for having me um to anyone watching i did not read the book right but i've been watching along um so, you know let's see where uh where the five of the silver pants goes who knows? Jackie kind of called me and pressured me into this, or not? I don't know. <laughs> or, or not? I do never. joined our first brave participant, but the hard part of joining Judy Bello is you have to close the YouTube window because we don't want to hear our playback. So she's laughing. I am going to add Judy Bello. To Hi. Our- Hi. <laughs> and, and so great. Let me spotlight. This is uh, a personal hero of mine. Uh, she happens to be my mother. She's also a master educator. So please tell us about yourself and what brings you tonight. Uh, I practiced law for a long time and then I did what I was really most called to do and most passionate about. And that was I taught high school English for nine years, uh, which I had, I had a plan and my plan was never to retire. But life happened and I had to retire to take care of a sick family. And so I'm very fortunate that others in my family are educators and I continue to be passionate about it. And I think everyone on this panel, including the audience, has been stupendous. Congrats to all of you. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, great. We Look at this live action. Well, I want to bring in, we already have an incredible question on the chat. Thanks to Emily McKnight. So I'm going to throw it to the group. It's what are you all doing to support kids with special needs and their parents during this crazy time? I'm curious, does anybody on the panel want to take that one for starters? I see you, Dan Kelly, pulling it up. <laughs> uh, let me, let me bat lead off here, but pass it off to anyone else who wants to share it in a moment. Um, this this really might sound a little bit like a bit of a cop out answer, um, but it's it's not. So um, I, I I keep I keep thinking of a sort of a graphic design uh, um, image that I saw once, which was showing how um, just even designing um, like an entryway into a building that's eight feet off the ground, uh, you can build stairs or you can build a ramp, and the ramp lets everybody in you know, um, whatever abilities you may have, you can get up the ramp, but stairs are, you know, uh, prohibit certain people from being able to access it in the same way. I think that when we try to design all of our lessons, all of our interactions around the idea that we want to make them accessible for everybody, I think like when you build it ground up like that, that's a best practice to try to make sure that we're helping all of our kids, especially kids with special needs. So for example, right, like, when you think about, well, what is something that somebody might benefit from after a math lesson, right? Like, um, well, maybe if there's a video of me explaining it, 
again, uh, just maybe a slightly different way, but a video of me going over several different practice problems, similar to the ones we did in class, then the video could be something that a kid could watch at their own pace, again, um, rewinding and, and starting again and skipping the parts they don't need to see. That video is helpful for all kids. It's certainly helpful for kids with special needs, but anybody could take advantage of that. And that would just be one example. Uh, just whatever we can do to be deliberate about making sure that our lessons are accessible, um, that our lessons take the time, that they're deliberate, that they're well paced, um, that you don't talk too fast, which sometimes I do when I get really, really excited. Um, these are these are all the things that try to slow it down just in a way to make sure that we're not going too fast uh, and that we're giving access to everybody. Um, so that's one way to think about all lessons is just to start with the idea that they should be accessible to anybody in any way. Um, and then I wanna pass it off to anyone who wants to bounce off that idea, enhance it, uh, add to it. I just want to say um, the slowing down is something that I struggle with. <laughs> and I just do think for educating all students, but especially students with special needs, the process of getting feedback, like feedback is a gift and getting to know them really well. And so kind of being able to make sure I check in with students about how did that go for you, whether it was over Zoom or otherwise. Um, but I'm curious, does anyone else want to jump in? Sure, um, I can jump in as well. Um, I think one of the things to first um, really acknowledge during this time, particularly, um, is that this is a really, really challenging time. Um, and it's difficult for everyone, but it can be particularly difficult for uh, students with special needs. Um, and it's it can be particularly diff difficult for students with special needs across many different spectrums, right? Both um, in, in terms of learning, but also in terms of um, emotional wellness and, and things like that. So. Um, acknowledging that and um, having this kind of in, in the front of our minds as a mindset, I think becomes very important. Um, and then the other thing that I would, um, that I do in terms of kind of training and coaching educators um, during this time is to be as flexible as you can in terms of how the learning happens, right? Um, and this is a best practice, I think, for um, all learning, but particularly now, um, be very flexible and be, give a lot of grace in terms of how the learning is going to happen um, and, and what the um, uh, when we when I talk about when we talk about inclusive learning, we talk about the um, the content, the process, and the product, and how we can make all of those more inclusive to all learners and accessible for, for all learners. Right, so making sure that. Uh, the content that we offer and deliver is in multiple forms, um, whether it's you know text, but also video, um, having the visual modality, um, and uh, bringing in a bunch of other modalities as well, even musical, right? And then the process of delivery, um, how we do it, um, can also be made more, much more accessible. And finally, the product, how students show us what they have learned, um, can also be quite flexible, and how we kind of diversify those as well. Um, and so go lean hard right now into all of that as a teacher, right? Um, is lean as hard as you can, make it as flexible as you can, um, be comfortable with extensions, with things that are not hard and fast deadlines because we emphasize that the learning is the most important thing. Um, so let go of a lot of those, this has to be done my way for it to be okay. Um, a lot of those also kind of um, things that we've talked about before on this panel in terms of um, policing and structuring exactly how we want students to behave, let it go just let it go entirely um, during this time. I'm an advocate for always, but especially now um, in terms of what that is. And the other thing that I think we've talked about a bit, but that I would highly encourage um, is the building of relationships with parents and, and the broader community um, becomes very important this time. So that communication that's happening um, between parents and educators is crucial um, and extending grace both ways across that relationship, I think really can do a tremendous amount. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. I see Judy Bella with her hand in the air, but first I have to introduce our next brave uh, pop-in, the one and only Megan Kelly. Megan Kelly, please introduce yourself. What brings you tonight? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm super honored and, and glad to be here. Um, I know some of the panel really well, and I'm very excited to, uh, to be here. Um, I am a uh, biology instructor at the college level. And uh, I have been really loving these uh, these weekly chats. Um, I would I would I want to echo what Laurel just said about having so much grace for our students right now. We have students um, that are so so we're all online, my college, and we have students who are have a lot um, 
different um, expectations when they're living at home rather than living rather than living on campus. So I have students who are both going to college full time and working full time. And um, and then they have kind of limited Wi-Fi access, but they have limited room in their house to be able to kind of communicate um, with us versus, you know, they're sharing the, the internet with their, or the computer even with their siblings, or they have to watch their little niece or whatever. Um, and so being able to be flexible with your students as much as possible is such an important thing. Flexibility. So hard, <laughs> yeah. um, but we're, we're practicing nice. it tonight <laughs> um, with our flexible model of come one, come all. Let me again, just remind everybody, not just a small step subscribe, but the link. Um, I am. I want to go back to Judy Bello. I saw your hand in the air. So I'm going to bring you back and mom uh, join in. Uh, first, I want to tell Megan how delighted I am to see her because I've enjoyed your comments throughout the, these panels. Um, I also want to note that while teachers' jobs are endless, um, in many jurisdictions, child, young children with special needs were, will be the first back in the classroom. Uh, they're deemed a very high priority because for many of them, it's harder to learn virtually. And when they are back uh, in the classroom, um, communications with them and their parents by the teacher is invaluable. Uh, as Megan was saying, basically, um, because, and as Laura was saying, it's very important for them to feel emotionally supported and cared about. Um, some of them feel like they've gotten lost and the, that, of course, enormously frustrates the parents. So that's one suggestion I would throw out there. Great. And then um, Zachariah, just to put you on the spot, I'm interested in the early childhood space as well. I feel like there's even more parent involvement there. I don't know if this environments where you've taught have been inclusive with regards to special needs, but just anything that you'd want to weigh in from an early childhood lens. The, um, so, so the environments that, I ha that I've been in, I, I, it's sort of a gray area of, of inclusivity. There were, there were um, the schools that I worked at, there weren't students with IDP. Specifically, but there were there were students with um, I, I think if if they were in another school setting that that they probably would have had IEPs and, and you simply work with students that, uh, and uh, their families as you need to. Um, I, I recall from last spring because right now I'm not in uh, in a school, so I don't want to speak too much out of my depth. But last spring we just recognized what a struggle it was for uh, for the pre-K and kindergarten students in particular. Um, and part of it comes down to, to tech skills with, uh, with you know, first graders and older having some experience uh, at our school with, with the tech platforms, but also some of it comes down to just development, um, the way the brain functions in early childhood. Um, children, um, some of you may be familiar with the phrase, are really concrete learners, that they learn um, by the physical world around them, by what they're touching, uh, what they're jumping on, uh, what they're running from. Uh, and, you know, the, the idea, of course, of, of you know, a, a, another human being on a screen um, where you're learning in that format, I think uh, many kids uh, these days have experience with um, some sort of FaceTime um, with, you know, with a family member. But the learning aspect looked so different, um, not just the that, that concrete aspect was missing, but um, early childhood uh, classrooms really thrive on routine. Um, and while everyone's routine was being disrupted uh, during the pandemic, um, when it initially happened, uh, just having kids out of routine with um, with materials, with uh, you know the physical setting in the classroom, with their friends and teachers, um, was really disruptive. And and so I I, you know, I, wonder, I found myself wondering at the beginning of this year um, with early childhood students who are starting uh, online, and I do know plenty of. Uh, schools are starting in person pre precisely because of the learning difficulties of that age group online. But um, online, how are uh, students, or rather, how are teachers handling that? How are they setting up routines? How are they building community? You know, it's one thing when you uh, are, um, you know, the school year is disrupted uh, in March, and, and that was, you know, traumatic for a lot of people, but, but it's another when you don't even have the relationships set up to work from, and you're having to uh, develop those virtually. So those are those are a couple of challenges that would come to mind from a childhood perspective. Awesome. Thank you, Zachariah. We got another um, question in the chat. I'm going to pull it in here. 
Um, oops, that was my response. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. From um, Neil Newman. And I just want to do a little uh, shout out tonight. Neil is my husband. And uh, this morning we found out for sure that he's becoming a dad. <laughs> oh my God, look at this. I guess I should, be, uh, I should spotlight my own sonogram at this point, but <laughs> this, this was exciting. This this made it real. So Neil Newman, I love you. Congrats on um, becoming a dad for real. It feels more real um, today. And thanks to those who have been celebrating and cheering me on on this journey. Um, but let's go back to Neil's question, which is for students at the college level, though I think this uh, applies to all levels, how do you balance flexibility and understanding of life circumstances with the requirements for understanding challenging topics and exam slash standardized tests? So I would summarize this as how do you balance understanding and flexibility with rigor? Because Neil asked this at the college level, Megan, do you mind if I spotlight you first? No, not at all. That'd be great. And, and congratulations. That's so very <laughs> Um So yeah, Neil, very good question. And um, we have we have shifted also from a semester system to a quarter system at our college um, for the first time. And so our our which means our we've got about seven and a half weeks which each with each set of students, and that they're very intense weeks. So it has meant. So there, there are different ways that we've kind of dealt with it. Um, we had a student who um, unfortunately had um, an accident. And in terms of being able to make up material, um, she just wasn't able to. And so, you know, because she was kind of out of school for about three weeks, and that's at that point, that's almost half the semester. And so kind of working with her, we actually worked with her to kind of withdraw from the class and she'll be taking it again. Um, in the spring. So kind of flexibility um, in terms of being able to kind of maybe decide that maybe now is not the time to take the course if you're having problems um, that just kind of are more important than taking a biology course. Um, and and also we have decided to kind of, instead of having, I teach um, labs mostly. And so instead of having one really long lab a week, we have two shorter labs which allows for us to have kind of really nice uh, discussions with the students. And it also allows us to kind of catch up with students and make sure everybody's kind of on the same page with making sure their assignments are, um, you know, in good shape, make sure they're understanding kind of where they are with graphing or lab reports or whatever. Um, and so having that uh, check in with the students twice a week, especially for such a short amount of time is, is so important. Um, we also uh, record all of our sessions and they are just only for the students in the class to watch. And so they can actually kind of asynchronously be able to watch the material that they that they missed. And then it's a lot of time, honestly, it's a lot of time that means that I kind of meet with students a lot more than I um, may typically. I think this is actually a great push to create more asynchronous material mm -hmm. to help people catch up, which is something we've always tried to do for kind of remedial or reteaching. Does anybody else want to weigh in here on rigor versus flexibility and understanding and maybe how you're pivoting and adapting yourself based on all the issues your students are going through? I'll jump in for a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I think first of all, Meg. Hi, Meg. <laughs> Thanks for joining in. Um, also, what, a, what like what a power move by Jackie to be you know uh, leading this conversation about very important things during very wild times, uh, and to sort of drop the like drop the like yeah. So it's a really cool. Congratulations, Neil, uh, my husband. Uh, you're going to be a dad. You know, read. I'm pregnant. And so back to balancing the priorities of our students. You know. <laughs> Like, and and you know and and in, in full with full sincerity, you know, Jackie, you know how important all these things these things are. But uh, the, so so is parenthood, of course. So congratulations, Thank that's you. awesome. Um, so I think that's the main thing I want to say. But but also, um, I think that just reminding ourselves that, um, and this actually connects to I think what Jackie, what Ju your mom Judy was saying before. But um, I think that if a, a class period goes by. <clears throat> and I haven't said out loud each kid's name more than once, then I feel like I've failed because I think that kids want to hear their name. They want they want to be acknowledged and, and not like, Jackie, stop talking, <laughs> not that. No, more like, oh, I see Jackie's comment in the side there, or I'm really glad that uh, Maggie joined us or, or just, so one, include 
your, your kids' names. But two, um, in terms of like figuring out like how do we balance the the standards and with also the flexibility understanding the times, having one-on-one check-ins with each kid is, is, is great. It can be very hard if you have 50 or 60 or 200 students as our panelist Michael currently has 230, I think. And so another way to do it is to just embrace the technology like Google Forms that allow you to survey your students and say, have, you know, even on a, like a, even on a test, I gave an assessment today, but even, even on that, one of the last questions was like, by the way, how can I support you better? What, what, do, what do you like so far about remote and hybrid learning? Um, one question, what don't you love about it so far, you know, yet being a key, key idea. And if you could change anything, what, what would you change? Because then even if you don't have the time to connect with each kid one-on-one, you are handing them the microphone to say, listen, if you have an idea, I want to listen. Now, of course, it's really important then that, that you then follow up as much as possible, um, highlighting different ideas, have a slideshow where you just, you know, copy and paste some of the nice things that you see, um, but give kids the chance to speak up. Oftentimes they know what they need or at least what they want. And then you can sort of, you can go from there, uh, but give, give them that jumping off point to give them the idea. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. Cynthia, I see you. I see you. I want you to jump in here. Um, sorry, it's a, it's a bad habit that I have probably of, of over jumping in. One thing I, I wanted to add in that, Dan, that I think is so important is that businesses and leaders really have to think about the psychology of their employees who are also parents, potentially if they're parents of children of special needs. Right. And I love that you're asking, you know, tell me what you need, because I think as adults, we condition ourselves into this space of not telling others what we need. That for so long pre pandemic, we were just going to kind of push through. Right. And now it's a case of, wait a minute, I can't make the 30 meeting. And that's perfectly OK. You know, I tell my teams, I don't need an explanation. Right. You, you tell me what you need and you run your life. It's perfectly acceptable. Let's rearrange accordingly. Because to the point you made, Laurel, this is not a normal time. And we need to stop thinking that like tomorrow we're going to wake up and everything is going to go back. Some things won't. So we've got to continue to support each other. And as a leader, it's been very important to me to tell my, my, my teams and my parents, look, do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself, your children, and your family. Wow, that is super powerful. And I want to um, pull in that something that uh, Erica Westcott Kelly said in the chat, which was as a parent of a toddler, that lack of routine was so tough this spring. I'm curious, Dan, um, you are a teacher and a parent too, kind of uh, just anything that you'd wanna jump in and share about kind of how to support working parents <laughs> during sure. the spring time? Actually, yes, I have, I, do have a few answers that I actually want to collect my thoughts. Yes. Uh, Maggie, if you could, uh -huh. um, I would, I think that people would like to hear connecting what, what Judy just said, sorry, what, what Cynthia just said. Um, Maggie, do you want to tell the story of the moment from Frozen 2 that what? we were talking about where um, Kristoff comes in at the end? Uh, to Anna? I think, I think that's enough for you to take over. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I'll, 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 I'm not trying to give you a hard no, time. No. I think you know exactly what I'm talking about because I think it's a really important moment of support. So Maggie, yep. go ahead. Right. So um, I don't know if everybody's seen Frozen, Frozen 2. If you have um, kids in your life, uh, say a niece who's almost four who loves Frozen 2, yeah. um, it might be something you've watched. You should so, straight up watch it even if you don't have kids. It's a great movie yeah. in my opinion. Go ahead. Yeah. So so kind of what he's talking about is is Anna is, is essentially – um, running away from these huge kind of earth elementals who are like they're gigantic and they're chasing her and she's obviously trying to get them to chase her um, and she kind of is alone in this and then all of a sudden Kristoff uh, comes by and he's on his reindeer Sven and uh, he kind of um, swoops in and kind of grabs her and kind of helps her get away from these um, from these giants um, and he says to her um, what do you need Aww. And she tells him, I need to get, you know, I need to get to the dam. And he just goes like no explanation needed. Just um, he just goes because he kind of trusts her enough to know what she needs. And and so he's going to do it. He's, he's ready to, to support her in any way she needs. Oh, that gave me that gave me chills. What do you need? Um, I see Judy Bello raising her hand. So I'm going to go ahead and spotlight you. 
Well, I thought Neil's question is excellent because we don't want to abandon the rigor of education. I taught at a very intense competitive STEM school uh, and I was determined to promote the normal English agenda. But my first responsibility I felt was to help this each student holistically. And at such a pressured school, uh, there was too much sleep deprivation, too much grade competition, too much anxiety. I felt it was very important to be flexible in the sense of extending deadlines. They still needed to learn about English, um, but I think this is a time where you can do both if you, and several people talk to this, you can promote rigor and sustain it by asynchronous uh, materials available to the students when they're ready for it. Um, but in the moment, there's so much anxiety by both parents and students and counselors and social workers, et cetera. First, we really do need to just reassure people um, so that we can avoid uh, drastic consequences when people are depressed and feel unappreciated. That's um, great. I'm so glad you mentioned anxiety because we had a great chat um, question come in through Facebook Live um, from uh, one of my mom's cousin, Rosemarie Hippler. Uh, the question is for students applying to college, high school seniors who lost a summer and test opportunities, thoughts on reducing anxiety. Does anyone, anyone want to weigh in on that kind of college application or high school senior place? Sure, um, I can take it if no one else wants to. Um, so I think, uh, as I said before, um, and as Cynthia kind of called out, this is an, an, you know, it's overused, but it's an unprecedented time. It's not a normal time. Um, and the kind of losses and misses that students are experiencing, especially at this age, you know, um, those who just graduated and those who are going into the senior year, um, it's, it's devastating because these are things that they were kind of promised they were going to be able to go through in a normal way and that's been taken away. So I think the first step um, here is to acknowledge that, to acknowledge, um, name it and um, make time even for the grief and loss that comes with like losing some of these opportunities um, and letting, um, letting students know that it's okay to feel really bad about this. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and share and express those emotions, um, but also know that they're going through it with uh, a whole group of other students around not just the country, but the world who are kind of undergoing this as well. Um, and so I think the next thing would be kind of trying to build um, relationships and community in spaces where students who are going through this can talk to each other about it. Um, the other thing that I would say is um, to, I think those of us who are, you know, a bit older and not going through this right now, when you are an adolescent, everything does seem really, really high stakes. And, and so a loss like this can be so devastating. Um, so it's important to empathize with that, but also use our kind of wisdom to let them know that it might feel like the end of the world. And in some ways it is, um, but in other ways, it's it's not that, that they are resilient, that humans are resilient, and, and we will kind of push through this and figure out a way forward. And it might be different and not what we expected. Um, but um, look at examples of you know, alternatives that people have already come up with and ways that, that humans have adjusted and adapted and point to those and then think about and, and brainstorm what are the ways that um, students can get through this as well. So those are just some tips I throw out there. I don't know if anyone else has ideas or thoughts on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up there. I think in addition to the acknowledgement, I would also highlight the importance of regular check-ins, uh, regular but not too much. Um, in, enough to to let your kid, your student, um, enough to let them know that you're thinking about them um, and that you will offer a listening ear and that you can have an empathetic story to share as well, because this is something that, albeit affects everyone differently, it's still affecting everyone. And, and I think we each have, uh, you know, at least one, you know, crappy moment, uh, if not daily, then, then certainly over the course of the past uh, several months where, where we can empathize with anyone of, um, of any age. I think it's a really humanizing uh, experience that we're going through. Um, I, I think there's also um, something equalizing about that. 
Um, and and my, you know, when I first saw that question, my first reaction was just to say, well, everyone's going through it, so you know, it, it's it's equalizing in that manner. But you know, I, I think that that rationalizes it to uh, an unhelpful degree. Like, yes, it is, but also if if a kid who is going through um, loss and and families too of of students who are going through loss of, of typical events, not to mention you know real losses of of, of health and life. Um, they don't necessarily need to hear that logical response. They need to be um, empathized with, they need avenues to talk, uh, to be heard out. So I, I think that the check-in would be one. Um, I also thought about the importance of using the time wisely, wh wh whatever that means to, to that child to create, uh, to create something. And I, I think art comes in all sorts of forms. I think we are all uh, artists in, in one way or another. Um, and I think using this time to to create, whether you're a writer, um, a musician, a singer, um, you, you want to take up a new hobby to to, to create and express. Um, one of the things I've always enjoyed about uh, art and, and, and being a performer is that there is an avenue for literally every human emotion um, under the sun. And if you're feeling good some days, um, great, you can express that. Um, if you're having long periods of um, of doubt or anxiety or depression, A, it's understandable, um, but B, there are also, there are creative avenues um, that can help you get through it now. And, and I think when people look back on it, they will appreciate knowing that um, they use this time to, to both change themselves and to create something that wasn't um, on this earth before. I, I think that's a great opportunity for creation. Such a, a beautiful spin. Um, I'm curious, you know, Rosemary asked about anxiety on the students' parts. I just as a, oh, and I actually just want to read her response right now. Um, she said, my students have written insightful essays on the impact of COVID, impressive and thoughtful, makes me feel very good about this generation. Um, I'm, I'm so glad, Rosemary, that you, you jumped in to respond because one of my anxieties just as a, a US citizen and, and um, a human is like the learning loss from the spring, we, the, we always have learning loss, especially for disadvantaged students over the summer, um, if they don't have as much access to high quality programming, and now continued over the fall. And so I'm just curious, can anybody ease my anxieties about like the future of our country? Are we, is this urgent? Like, are we dramatically falling behind wherever we're supposed to get learning wise, career development wise, or is anyone feel like this is all gonna be okay? Dan Kelly, please help me. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I don't want to say this is all going to be okay because I don't I don't want to minimize what's real and and what's hard and 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 the real losses, right? Um, so I, I, you know it's funny because I was just trying to say it is going to be all okay, Jackie, and and in in large and important ways it will be, but I don't want to minimize the the people who have died. I don't want to minimize the traumatic pain that people have gone through. Um, you know I can I can paint a couple different pictures. So one is. <clears throat> the like, and, and I forget if I mentioned this last week, I think I did, but just, just looking in on a, on a cafeteria and what you imagine a school cafeteria, what you all think, listening to my voice now, picture when you think, oh, middle school cafeteria or high school cafeteria, right? And, and take that and put it in its place with its pros and cons for sure. And, and take for a moment and shift that out of focus and imagine just a grid of 40 by 40 individual desks and you know, that would be uh, one quarter filled. We're talking about dozens and only dozens of sixth graders, tiny little kiddos eating with like taking their mask down, eating and then putting their mask back up and like silence. And that's what's happening in middle schools across the country right now. Um, and it is heartbreaking that like that's where we are. But then also take some of the same kids, take my eighth graders and put them in a classroom and um, you know, one of my favorite things to do in every class <clears throat> is at some point have a talking break. We also do mask breaks where we literally say, all right, let, let's get out of here. And we just <laughs> get up. Everyone who everyone who's on chat, um, you were know, like, hey, take five minutes, go for the walk. Uh, we're gonna sign back in and you know, at, at exactly 12, 25 or whatever. Um, and those are the kids are in my room. We get up, we walk out of the room, we walk outside, something I've been wanting to do for years. I now have permission to do as a teacher, which is just take kids outside for a minute. Like everyone spreads out, everyone takes their masks off for a little bit. We talk about stuff and then, and then like, okay, cool. That was awesome. Let's cut back, let's get back to work. 
but that's the highlight of my day. But so is even when we're inside, we take talking breaks. And I say, okay, kiddos, like you um, in the room, um, I need you to turn and talk to someone next to you. Uh, not about math, as much as I love math, about anything else. And then I'm gonna talk to some people in the chat remotely at home too. And I keep like doing these gestures so people know who I'm talking to. And the people who are in the room, I'll say, if you're not sure what to talk about, turn to your neighbor and say, my name is, and what's your name? Or you could say, um, so how's your day? Or you could say, so do you like things? And just, just something to just conversational openers. And then I just sit back for a second and just watch the kids talk to each other. And you can see their body language change as they're like, this is like, I can connect with a real human being right now. Um, and get, denying them that is one of the worst things we can do. So give them that, give them that moment and see them, see how nice they can be. And then lastly, if you're looking for a moment uh, for like hope, um, in the survey I submitted today, a student, I will say her name is Rachel, I'm not gonna give you her last name, one, just one of the many, many wonderful sweethearts I get to teach. Um, and I say that, I say that of my young men and my women, they're all sweethearts. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I asked, what's one of your favorite parts of remote learning? And her answer was being able to run and give my mom a hug between classes. Oh, <laughs> I think that's a, that's a winner right there. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing, Dan. <laughs> Anybody else want to weigh in, Laurel? Yeah, um, I'd love to weigh in on this um, because I think what you were highlighting, I think the thing that's most pressing for me that you highlighted is the... Um, potential to exacerbate disparities, right? And that's the thing that I'm more worried about than than learning loss generally. Because um, when I hear learning loss, I mean, it's something that we think of in the US, but it's also worldwide, you know, um, the OECD is always talking about like learning loss that happens, but that loss, um, what's actually happening is um, documented and measured by what we base learning in, like how we measure learning, right? And how we measure learning in those ways are standardized tests really, right? So it's looking at, how students tested at a certain time versus how they tested at another time, right? And so then anytime you're using a standardized test to measure learning, you also have to ask the question, are we are we measuring what we want to be measuring? Are we measuring the right thing in terms of learning and what is actually lost, right? Um, so yes, it's a, a worry, but I don't worry as much about it because I also don't have 100% faith in the test that we are measuring exactly what we want to be measuring because I think that this experience that everyone is going through is a tremendous opportunity for us to learn, all of us, including our students. Um, and we are, I think, learning about ourselves, we're building resilience, we're learning in different ways. Um, schooling is not the same as learning. Those are two different things. Hopefully learning is happening in schools, but it's definitely not the only site or place that it can happen. And so I think tremendous amounts of learning are still happening that um, might not be happening had this not happened. Um, and so then I also think about experiential learning and how that works and knowing that, um, we learn a tremendous amount more, right? If we go through kind of experiential learning and we go through experiences, but the only way that that actually hits home and lands is if we have some type of intervention that helps us to reflect upon and understand the experience that we went through. Um, and that's, I think, a place that we as educators always come in in experiential learning, but we can come in for this experience as well um, and help students to make sense of what they've gone through. Um, and I've seen you know, um, comments about how um, students are writing essays about this actual experience and what it's been like for them and, and how they've handled it. And, and that's going to be a way that um, we can also try to mitigate some of the like quote unquote learning loss um, by thinking about, okay, this is a real experience that we all have been through. It's a shared experience. How do we help our students make meaning and actually learn and, and grow from this as well? Laurel, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna keep you on spotlight if that's okay, because a question came in that I've um, highlighted, which is, I'm curious mm -hmm. if the panel knows of the various educational philosophies in other countries and how they compare to ours, are other countries handling this pandemic in a better way? Um, Laurel, just because you have experience in Mauritius and Rwanda, doesn't make you the international expert, but um, I'm curious if you want to jump in at all based on your experience of what you're seeing at African Leadership University. Um, sure, I'd uh, be happy to respond to that. I mean, I can't, as you, I said, I'm, I'm not an expert um, in, in every country and how they're handling it, but. <laughs> I can say hands down overall that other countries have handled COVID quite a bit better than the US. Um, I think it's not a controversial statement at this point, um, just in terms of, of numbers. Um, but um, <laughs> if, if you just want to look quantifiably, um, but um, 
you know, and, and so Rwanda, I'll take that case, is, is a country that um, very much um, has um, handled the, the pandemic much better in a much more kind of just structured um, way. Um, and so, so first off, I guess there's the handling of the pandemic in terms of the actual pandemic itself and public health um, and that kind of infrastructure and building that up and having kind of just like guidelines. And if you do that well, then you don't need to be out of school for as long, right? And, and we see that that Rwandan schools are, have been able to reopen. Um, and, um, but they were closed for quite a bit of time and there was a lot of concern about what was happening um, in terms of that. But there was um, in that country kind of a nationwide agreed upon response to how it would be, whether it was getting people food when they needed it, um, when they weren't working, to the education, right, where there's a shift to a lot of people don't have access to technology, um, but they do have radios. So a shift to even like television and radio programming for, for children and things like that. So it was just kind of a, a, a nationwide systematic, how do we handle this? What are the different kind of interventions that we can do um, that that, um, that that country used to respond that we haven't really had in the US um, for, for a number of reasons, right? One of them being that our education system is highly decentralized as opposed to a lot of other countries where they are much more centralized. So making that kind of nationwide decision is much more feasible. Rwanda is also a very small country, so it's easier to make a nationwide um, decision and just apply it across the country, um, which isn't necessarily, uh, that's the thing about comparing like countries is that you can't just do what somebody else did all the time, unfortunately. Because um, I have actually studied international education, and that's one of the major flaws. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't look towards things. And then, you know, everyone's gold star for the best education system is um, Finland. Um, and they, I think, are always going to be better placed to respond to something like this because they already are, um, they have systems in place to prioritize what I was talking about before, like prioritize the learning um, and prioritize the well being of both students and teachers um, in a way that the US. It's not really there yet, or if we are there, it's in pockets as opposed to nationwide. I'll stop there. Thank you, Laurel. Um, anybody, I know we've jumped all over in a few topics, but has anyone not gotten to say something? I just wanna make sure on earlier topics. Great, otherwise I want to um, shout out an earlier um, shout out, which was for Cynthia based on her comments. So I'm gonna pull you back up, Cynthia. I'm just curious, like you have supported um, the 99 Pages EDU Panel, you've been joining us every week. Um, do you have a question that you'd like to ask this group of educators? Absolutely. Um, first of all, Jackie, thank you. You've been a phenomenal mm -hmm. colleague. Um, I I love that we've been able to support each other in our pursuits and share ideas. It's it's been really great. Um, and in approaching it from different spaces, right, and different perspectives, right, which we all talk about is is a great thing to do. But rarely do we do it. One thing I would like to ask is. As a non-educator, and I don't think this is asked often enough, as a non-educator, how can I support each of you? What does the future look like? And not just pandemic, not just we're in a remote or we're hybrid. How do we transition this to where we are better? We are more competitive. You know, I've thought for a long time that the U.S. school system, and not due to lack of educators, but due to lack of let's say infrastructure and everything else was not on brand with what a lot of other countries are doing. How, how do we, how do you pull in non-educators into this community space so that we are informed, we are supportive of your actions? Thank you. And I summarized it a little bit and something I want to know, how can we, the country better support and recognize educators and what can non-educators do if they're if they're worried about these issues as well about equity issues in in our country or about anything so does anybody want to want to jump in on this one it's such an important question but it's such a big one too and so i'm 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 i'm, I'm computing <laughs> uh if other people want to jump in please <laughs> Sure. I just I, talked a lot. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so I, br briefly, I'll say that the more uh, I sit around and, and think about the world and the U.S. in particular, um, the more I understand the importance of systems um, and governments. And it, it is often um, folks at the sort of uh, the, you know, the exit end of the funnel uh, that get the brunt of criticism, whereas it is folks who are at the at the top of the funnel. I'm not sure if the tunnel uh, <laughs> really works for this, but uh, the funnel really works for this. Um, 
but yeah, I, I guess you know putting putting emphasis on de decision makers, putting pressure on decision makers, um, organizing um, amongst communities to uh, to amplify a voice. It's it's one thing um, if if someone hears a concern from one person or two people and it's disconnected. Uh, it's something very different if you hear that. Uh, that same voice amplified among thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, uh, particularly with with elected uh, positions, and we have many elected positions of power, and um, those folks are beholden to constituencies and and do have an obligation to uh, to listen. And when there is enough of of a strong voice that is um, pushing for something, um, I, history has shown either people. Uh, the people in power respond or they get voted out and someone who will do that work um, steps in. So I, I think that's the first thing that came to mind is is look at the systems and power uh, in place and uh, and address that. Awesome. I'm actually going to uh, point up, bring it up to Judy. Great. Hold on. I'm spotlighting you, mom. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I just want to also, that was a wonderful question, Cynthia, and Zach got to the answer. I just want to embroider it just a tiny bit. It's obviously a time of great turmoil regarding the inequities in our country uh, and the way, how, how much we can improve public education. And so everyone who cares about that should be advocating with governments at the federal, state, and local level for more support for teachers, more support for schools, the allocation of resources that, that, that are needed with a special focus on the equity gap, uh, which this pandemic has accelerated and magnified. So going forward, we have the opportunity, we have a voice. We have a voice every day. We have an especially big voice in the pending elections, but after the elections, going forward, we can't just sit back and say, oh, well, I'll get active again in another two years or four years on an ongoing basis. We have to make sure that our voices are heard on all these really important issues. I couldn't agree more. And I'm going to jump in with a little quote that actually is quoted in the book. Um, let me... Uh, Again, Educator Book Club, uh, on page 205, it's in the uh, story or the chapter on teaching middle school students to advocate by Carolina Drake. She says, philosopher Hannah Arendt, who describes education as the task of renewing a common world, argued that, and the quote is right below, education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it. And so this idea of how do we support educators, one, of course, advocating for change, but two, um, knowing how to encourage others to to vote. And and this chapter says teaching activism is so central to this task. It's how do we encourage others to assume responsibility for the world that we're in. So I'm just gonna do that happy little little book shout out. Anybody else want to join in? Sure. Um, Laurel, you have something to say. Yeah, Laurel. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I can jump in. Um, I want to say a couple of things. The first is um, that it's easy to be very down on the US education system. And I, I think was in my previous comments and talking about what other countries have done versus what the US has done. Um, but I also want to highlight the fact that um, the US education system is incredibly unique because our country is unique in terms of its diversity and it's a diversity of socioeconomic status. Um, because when you have a homogenous country and you have a highly um, like well-funded education system, it's very different from what we have functioning in the US, which is, um, you know, I think that almost 50% of the students in our public education system live below the poverty line, right? Which when you tell people that it's kind of a, a shocking thing, um, but you can Google it, fact check it um, to kind of delve into the data. But um, we actually do a tremendous job of educating um, very low income students. Um, so you have to compare kind of like how our um, education system performs to other countries who, who have students at the same socioeconomic status as ours does. Um, and, and so we're actually doing a pretty decent job of that. It's just a tremendously um, challenging job um, to do because you're compensating for um, a lot of things that students might not have access to and, and think about that opportunity gap and, 
and the um, the equity gap as well um, that Judy mentioned. Um, so uh, so uh, I, I, yeah. So one is I, I don't want to blame the U.S. education system too much because there are many instances of it doing uh, an amazing job. Um, so don't be too down on it. But with that said, there's so much room for improvement in so many ways, which we all know um, and we're very aware of. Um, and um, so very here for and on board of all the things that have been uh, mentioned already in terms of advocating for education and edu advocating for um, uh, at a political level. Um, but also if you have the means and ability and you want to volunteer your time, um, I think that um, bridging that gap between like what's happening in schools and, um, and the knowledge that you know, we, we can all be educators, right? And we can all um, visit classrooms and kind of share what we know, you know, as, um, if you have expertise in kind of just the professional world and what that's like afterwards and, and what, um, you know, different employers might be looking for, that's of tremendous value for both teachers and students to know. Um, so, you know, if you know an educator and you're willing to go and just talk to a class, I think that can be another way to uh, play that part. And that can kind of help build that community and, and make you a little bit more aware of what's going on in the school, um, th which will make you, I think, a better advocate politically as well. Thank you so much, Laurel. Anybody else? I'll, I'll jump in also, Laurel, speaking of the Googling things and, and, and seeing, sort of being invested in figure out for yourself some of these facts, um, <laughs> which is something we should also be teaching our kids who grow up to be adults. Like how, how do you, how does one research something? How does one fact check something, um, you know, independently and, and what sites are <laughs> reliable? Um, I would encourage anyone who hasn't done so already just you know, Google federal budget 2016, federal budget 2015, 14, pick a year and look at it. And I, I'm, I'm really not trying to say that the answer to all educational inequity and, and inequality is to throw money at it, because it's not. But also, when you look at how underfunded the, you know, the federal programs to invest in and support education are relative to many other programs, it does give you a sense of where our country's priorities are. And listen, a lot of those priorities are priorities and they are very important. But when you look at the slice of the pie and consider, you know, if you take a big old pizza and you cut it into fourths, then you have the big chunks. But then if you cut those fourths in half and in half again, and eventually you essentially have one kind of medium long strand of mozzarella, and, and and that's what the federal government allocates for education. And, you know, what does that say about sort of our, what, where our priorities are? Again, not just like, it's not like, oh, throw more mozzarella at it and this all the problems go away. They don't. But being smart about, about how we prioritize our, our money. And getting involved in local, you know, all, you know, so all politics is local, but getting involved in your local school systems, your local school board meetings, speaking up at meetings, things like that. I actually had an opportunity to speak up at a meeting this week and I missed it. Um, Jackie, this goes back to your question about tying in, you know, parenting and, and, and balancing all the things, but I actually am, am committing to being a little more involved in, uh, in the local board meetings, because I think that people need to hear all, all the voices and I am I'm one voice among many, but I should be using it to try to speak up. Thank you, Dan. I find that very inspiring. I know we're in our last minute, so just I'm going to keep everybody at the full view. And just I'm just curious for anybody what I feel like, you know, this book, this is, is a scary title, right? Teaching When the World is on Fire. And we have a lot of inequity. We have a lot of issues that we've talked about over the past four weeks. And so just to end with a little bit of optimism, what what can we be hopeful about during these challenging times? And anybody just raise your hand and we can go um, a little popcorn style. I'll go. Yeah, Cynthia, you're up. Then Judy. Um, I think if we look back as human beings, we are incredibly resilient. Mm -hmm. And if we look back over the past 20 years, what our generation has had to endure has made us very resilient. And I have great faith and hope that we will come through this. We will be more informed. Um, and that everyone who's younger and essentially living through this, they're going to have a different expectation and hold others accountable as they should and probably ask more questions and be more informed because they've lived through it. So I'm, I'm hopeful of what, what is next and what we build into. Thank you. And actually, I guess since it's 6.30, we will close with Judy Bello, if that's okay. Judy, what, what would you add? What are you hopeful about? I'm hopeful that out of these many crises will come more resolution, determination, 
uh, to, to build it back better, if you will, just to use a phrase, and mm -hmm. actually to work more on education, on climate change, and on other issues that are crucial in our country, like racial justice, and so on and so forth. We can do that. I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I want to thank the incredible six people who joined live with uh, with their, with with kind of no prep. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to end with a quote because we're ending out um, our month with teaching when the world is on fire. Um, and it's a quote that says, "If there's something to be learned from our experience, it's that people of conscious need to find one another and begin to act." So I want to thank this incredible group for finding each other. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining each other. And together, this kind of energizes me to strengthen how am I going to be a better educator and how can I act to make a difference in this world that is on fire. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Um, and again, see anybody next week that wants to join for Onward. Thanks again. Bye, everybody.